picked a really catchy title. Gatekeeping in Gen Z, content creation. Um, just to give you some context for this, I've managed some large teams, multiple studio teams, um, small tight-knit teams. And one of the things that I've really noticed is that studios are social spaces. What happens in those studios, as you'll know, is that you get small communities within them. They have different ways of communicating, but they're all trying to head towards one goal. Um, and ultimately, with the idea of working towards one goal, certain characteristics come out. And I started to look at Gen Z and some of their characteristics, and eventually looking at how TikTok is shaping some of their styles of communication. So I wanted to look at how Gen Z interact and help our teams, and also how we can take some of this into our own studio spaces. And I'm looking towards the idea of an anti-gatekeeping ideology. Um, the other thing I want to stress with this as well is that generational gaps aren't hard lines, they're, they're kind of soft lines, so obviously there's not a kind of cutoff, this is Gen Z and this is millennials and so on, um, but it just helps to understand that this is how Gen Z are, are using social media. Um, I really want to talk about how Gen Z engage on TikTok because I'm a passionate advocate of TikTok. You wouldn't necessarily have thought that, and six months ago I didn't think that myself. I kind of dismissed the app, and I was sort of very against what I had these kind of preconceived ideas about. But what I really noticed when I got onto TikTok was how Gen Z consume and how they create content is very different, and it's quite special there. And they've made TikTok a, a unique kind of experience. So kind of coming to gatekeeping, what I want to do is just explain briefly what I feel gatekeeping is, and it's changed. There's a subtle, subtle change that's happened in gatekeeping over the years, but for me, it's access to tools, it's knowledge bases, it's resources, and it's about essentially keeping information away from others. And we'll kind of talk about how that can be a subtle thing or a very direct thing. And essentially, it's as it says here, and there's lots of articles online about gatekeeping. This has become a big conversation right now, but it's the idea that people with their hands on the levers of institutional power um, it's also, though, really importantly about what issues deserve attention and who decides how those issues get the attention. Um, and also to decide which voices are seen and heard. So a classic example of a gatekeeper would be Anna Wintour, which is kind of ironic because it was Vogue's word of the year in 2022. Essentially, the idea of, say, something like Vogue is, is a great example. It's traditional power. It's held by a small, elite group of people. They're super wealthy. They're the tastemakers. They operate in really tight hierarchies. But gatekeeping thrives in many other spaces. It thrives in corporate power as well. It can be very subtle, um, but it's also deeply embedded into all of our systems. So if you work for any kind of corporate, gatekeeping will be built into that as a standard way of working. And gatekeeping is also really built into hierarchical structure. You might experience this yourself. You might look at your boss, for example, and think, how did they get to that position? Or how do they even keep that position? Or how do I get there? And if that isn't clear to you, then that can be a great example of, of gatekeeping. Um, the other smaller areas of this are the social economic factors. Um, it's a really huge factor in our industry, so creative industries. We know that actually there's a huge cost to get into the door. Let's say you're a stylist or want to be a stylist, you need to be time rich at the beginning. You potentially need to get clothes that you're going to put on a credit card. You need to intern for free, you need to work for free. There's a lot of things within the creative industry that are, are gatekept by social economic factors. And also in terms of language being commodified, um, you might hear people talk about a PIM or a DAM, for example, and you might not know what that is, and that's a small, subtle way of gatekeeping. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, it's a non-issue, it's just something that I had to learn, everyone has to learn, and it's a part and part of the industry. But hopefully this will kind of emphasize to some extent why this is an issue. So this is a percentage of female CEOs, Fortune 500 companies, in 2023, you can see it hit a massive 10.6%, which is kind of horrifying, that means that all the other CEOs, 90% of them, are male. That doesn't happen by accident. That's deliberate structural gatekeeping. And if you look in other areas, you would think in our industry that actually it should be more equal. We would hope, at least in, in the creative and fashion industries, but you can see here only 12.5% leadership positions held by women. And it gets even worse if you look in terms of um, ethnic distribution of power. And if you also think at the same time, the, the massive contribution that ethnic culture makes to fashion. You would hope that would be more of representation within our industry. And the, the thing I think is really important about this, and the key to me is the last part of this statement, if you remove the idea of ethnicity from it, the question becomes how can I help individuals fulfill their potential? 
And that's essentially what we want to be aiming to do. We want to strengthen our organizations and we want to kind of push people through the industry. And the other thing to be really aware of is obviously we, we have this unconscious bias. We all have it. It's something that is part of the system. It's something that's built into us. And we're very good at seeing it in something like an AI generating model. You can look at AI systems and say there's bias in that because it's giving you a very clear output. Um, but we have it within ourselves as well. I found that I had that as a, as a manager. If I wanted to put a team together, I would often just put the best fit team together because I want something done quickly. I want to know that I get the great creative output from it. I don't always want to think of something as a learning experience, but potentially there is a learning experience in, in every situation. So if you find yourself going to that idea of the team of best fit, then you, know, you need to kind of question that internal bias. So coming to social media, obviously we're all aware to some extent of the power of social media. Um, but I'd like to ask a question first. If you, if you have an Instagram account and you use it, can you put your hands up? Okay, and then keep, keep your hands up. If you, have a, if you have a TikTok, oh, it hasn't changed the slide. If you have a TikTok account, yeah, it's not many people. Okay, which is good, because that's sort of what I expected. Um, I expected there would be a big drop off, obviously, and potentially that would, have, uh, that would happen by age as well. Um, it's really important to understand that, that social media is a mirror, and we hear about this, you know, but do we, do we really consider how this impacts us? And Instagram really changed our behavior. If you, <clears throat> if you think that Instagram kind of came into position at the launch of iPhone 4, so there was a front-facing camera, and selfies didn't really exist before Instagram and that combination of technology at the same time, and it changed the way that we view ourselves. It changed some of the actions that we did. It also changed the way that we view food. If, is there anyone in the room that hasn't taken a picture of their, their meal? And if you think, there's, there's a couple of things there. You know, what are you actually doing? Why are you doing that? Did you ever do that before Instagram? There's very few people that probably would. But also, it changed how we view the world. If you, if you Google this, there's, there's thousands and thousands of people taking this picture all the time. And, Instagram and social media has changed our relationship with the world, it's changed our expectation, uh, but also the experiences we seek to create. And we really need to keep this in mind when we consider Gen Z and TikTok. So let's meet Gen Z, and as Thomas said in the introduction, they're, they're true digital natives. And the best way I always see this as, as framing it is that they've never lived in a world where the internet didn't exist. And to me, I find that kind of mind-blowing because that wasn't my experience. Um, but it really helps understand their, their social behavior. Um, also, the other thing with Gen Z is that their access to the internet would also be limited by social economic factors. So it's really important to understand that they're an incredibly diverse group. So you can't make bold statements about them, although I will make some. Um, they also grew up in a post-9-11 world. I have an architecture background. 9-11 for me was kind of significant in a way because I have a pre and a post view of 9-11. Um, but it's also important because in the, the years that came after that, we had some really big social change movements. We had Obama and the Hope campaign, we had Arab Spring, we had Occupy, Black Lives Matter formation and climate strike. And Gen Z have seen all these things emerge on social media, but they've also seen how they have potentially failed in, in many ways. So they can see the flaws of social media and the flaws of the systems around them. So it's resulted in a generation that are deeply skeptical and really questioning, but they're questioning structures of behavior, but they're also very questioning of the societal norms and conventions and also the idea of corporate power. They can see sometimes in a brutal way how previous generations have failed them. The good thing is, is that the Gen Z are focused on changing this behavior. And this is why I feel that we can learn a lot from Gen Z. Uh, they're focused on change, maybe unknowingly, which is kind of important, but they want to bring change, and you'll see that in their social media use. And also, it's worth considering that they are coming into a, a post-pandemic world, so they, they don't have a normal. They don't have a normal way of expectation of what the workplace should be, what the studio space should be. Um, the idea of career progression and corporate power is very different to them. Um, they're also very comfortable, as you can see it says here, with a change through, through structure. So they're not Gen X, they're not millennials, they're not saying let's just destroy everything. They're saying actually, you know, how can we have conversations that build on something and actually change things in, in our way of, 
using social media. Which brings me to TikTok. Um, one of the biggest ways I feel that they are changing behavior is, is on TikTok. And no one should underestimate the power of TikTok, and I think a lot of people in this room will be aware of it. But of those 4 billion downloads, 1 billion roughly of that, those downloads have come in 2023. So obviously, as we should all know, like TikTok is surging, but it's, it's really exploded this year. And it's also overtaking Google in terms of the traffic, which Google's held that as for the past 15 years, the most traffic going to a particular site. Um, and I should also say, I put some of these slides together kind of August, September, so you'll see some references. That if you're really on TikTok a lot, you might think this is out of date. Um, but maybe you'll be aware of some of these, some of these uh, videos I'm gonna show, and I, I won't show all the videos, I'll just show some sales from them. Um, but TikTok is really unique in the way that it's changed how people learn, it's changed how people access information. It skews slightly female, it's like 55%, 45% percent male, which I think is also important in the way that information is exchanged and community occurs on there. Um, but it's also very different to Instagram, and it's a lot easier to go viral. It's a lot easier to have a small account that suddenly explodes, because the algorithm is very different to the way that it works on Instagram. The thing that TikTok is really focused on is small quality content. It favors the micro-influencer. Instagram has a very different approach that you know you can be a, a huge account with a, a huge number of followings, and that resonates really well on Instagram, but TikTok is very unique and very different in that approach. Um, success on TikTok also relies, and this is really important, in the idea of creating community. Um, if you start a video with the idea that you, you say, for example, you can do this at the start of a video, it's very different to saying, look what I did. Instagram is very much about, look what I did. TikTok is about, hey, you can try something like this and, and you can achieve something also. Um, also, a fairly recent change is the idea that, that you can make 10 minute videos, so you can actually get a lot more dialogue going on TikTok now. Um, especially if you watch it at double speed, you can give a lot of information to people. And the other thing that is really important is the ease of the interface. It's incredibly easy to use. Uh, there's almost no learning curve, there's no barrier to TikTok, um, which again, if you think in the idea of gatekeeping, you can just pick it up and you can make content really quickly and easily. The other thing also is the stitch response. Is everyone aware of, of the, the stitch response? And maybe if you're not, maybe you have seen some of these videos. Um, this, this sort of uh, charity campaign that happened backfired because on TikTok, people can immediately take the beginning of someone's video and they can make a stitch response and they can actually change the dialogue that's happening. And the reason that's really important is that you can't control the narrative anymore. And that's also very important to understand with gatekeeping. Um, I made a word cloud using AI for this and just take a second to kind of view how the differences occur here. And one of them, the key one for me is obviously that the Instagram is very polished, it's very curated, it sticks around for a long time. TikTok is very spontaneous, it's authentic, it's viral, and it's fleeting. The really important thing with the idea of TikTok is that you can make a video and it can disappear quite quickly. And then the other key point, it's a horrible word, but the idea of education and entertainment together. Uh, it's really vital to understand that that works particularly well on TikTok and why TikTok is such a disruptor. So I'm gonna show you a video. This is the only video I'm actually gonna show you. It's, it's actually a minute long, but I'll show you just the 30 seconds of the video because I think it's really important to understand how particular content creators are setting out an anti-gatekeeping approach. Most common mistakes people make when they first start doing studio lighting. While breaking down the light on their shoe, you walk into the studio, you decide to use a red color armor. Imagine this is red. We pop a front-facing light onto our model, maybe a little bit on the side for a bit of depth. Your image looks fine. It's okay. How can we make it even better? I'm making the background pop. If you've been here before, you know I love lighting up a background. In this example, we're taking it one step further. I'm adding colored light onto a colored backdrop. This makes it rich, color more prominent. Let's say you've got this far. This is where people will make the mistake. Okay, so this is one of my favorite creators because 
she's really set her stall out. She's very anti-gatekeeping. The playlist is essentially titled as anti-gatekeeping. But what's really important to me is if you think of this as a lighting tutorial, how does that style differ from everything you might know about photography brands, lighting tutorials? Uh, there's no technical barrier to access. She's giving away all of the information that you need. It's super lo-fi. She's not super focused on her own voice. She, she, the edit, the audio edit is very kind of basic. She cuts herself off in lots of different places and it's really fast and it's really loose. And if you were to watch the whole video in a minute, she gives you a huge amount of information that you could then set up a shoot yourself. And there's a huge, amount of content creation that this creator is actually making. And the reason that this is really important and why I think it's a, a game changer for Gen Z and for us and where we can learn from it is that, that trust is really currency. Trust builds community and we know that if we can get trust from our audience, we'll, we'll bring them along with us and they'll want to continue learning with us. Um, I'll flick through a couple of these slides quite quickly to show that actually this is, I didn't search for gatekeeping by the way, I should put that kind of very clear at the beginning. I didn't sort of go into gate, uh, TikTok and try and find this as a, as a niche area. It's something that's, that's happening everywhere. And you can see that it's small influencers, micro influencers, but they're getting a huge amount of volume to, to their videos. But also it's people that are just starting out as a, as a basic kind of level. And I put this one up as well because it's interesting about influencer rates. This is at the time that I, I put this, had a, a million views. And it's a really great example of, if you think two, three years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get this information. And there's another one here, okay, how I get e-com jobs. There's another one, the experience of, I don't know if you can see behind the chair, but what it's like to be a model booked by a brand. And we have to be aware that people are having these conversations. They're having them outside of our studios and we can't necessarily control that and we should be aware of it and potentially get behind that. Uh, and also, TikTok is great for gossip as well. Um, Again, this is really important to understand that the brand can't control the narrative. So this photographer talks about a Vogue shoot, how much she got paid for it. Vogue got in touch with her, asked her to take the video down. She made another video explaining why she wasn't going to take the video down. And it's a very different behavior that, than we're used to. Um, a casting director giving information about models and a model, this is a great video also because it's a model that left an agency and she's just saying everything that kind of went wrong at the agency and how she was treated. And this information is, is out there and Gen Z are very clear they want to build this information and make it more visible. And the other thing that we should all be aware of is that Career Talk has one and a half billion views. People are looking for jobs via TikTok now. Uh, there's a wealth of information I don't know if you can see 400 million views about quitting a job to become a photographer. And if you think how different this is to say Glassdoor, you can look in here and you can say, well, I can see this person's experience. I can see the other videos. I can see they were a photographer. It's not anonymous. It's not faceless in the way that, that Glassdoor is. Um, becoming a stylist as well. There's huge opportunity here for brands to say, well, we can push our talent to the fore. We can inform the customer about a brand, but also we can attract people that want to come and join us within the business. And just to be aware with this, that you, you don't want to end up on this page. Um, there's some great videos under this one. Um, but again, it's really important to understand Gen Z, as Thomas said in the introduction, they, they're, they're social natives. They use dialogue and conversation online in a very different way that wouldn't be acceptable previously. And this, this kind of genie is out the bottle, we can't put it back, so we have to be aware of it and, and get involved with this now. Um, for me, this is a revolutionary stage, and we can really learn something with TikTok as a template, and we can bring change into our workspace. Because we have to understand that people love to learn. Uh, they love the idea of creating community, and the idea that transparency is really important. So if you remember that transparency is currency, and then you can really and trust, all of which combines to the most important commodity. What is TikTok about? TikTok is about video. How can we introduce video into our workspaces, whether it's learning guides, team updates, hints and tips, shoot reviews, etc. Maybe you're already using TikTok, not TikTok, sorry, video for interaction with people within your studio, but it's a really great way of interacting with Gen Z, but also allowing them to give their feedback. 
So the key areas for me, first relevant information, space for a response like the, the, the stitch, and allowing amplification of other voices. If you're making video content within your studio space, be fast, be relevant, give good information, and amplify the voice of others. Because ideally, what we want to get to, in whatever area we're looking at, is a more equal split, a more approachable space where actually information is available for people and people can feel that they can reach the goals that they're, they're trying to achieve. Um, so I feel we have a huge amount to learn from TikTok. I think there's a huge understanding that Gen Z have about social conventions that we don't necessarily have. I'm saying we, but as a group. And we can really learn something from them. So hopefully we'll have questions about how we can bring this into our community. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you. I really need some water, and there wasn't any water there. And I know it was meant to be there. Water, water, water. <laughs> it's fine now. Good. We'll find water for you. There's plenty uh, just outside in a second. Um, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, we have time for a few questions, so let's dig in. First one here, let's say I believe in TikTok approach, but my leadership is from a totally different generation and is skeptical. <clears throat> How do you recommend to go about that? I think that's a question about, is it about bringing TikTok into your working space or is it about what you can learn from TikTok? I think you can learn a lot from it that you can slowly educate your leadership. You can educate them about, okay, this is about interactive conversation, this is about information giving, and this is about an anti-gatekeeping idea of, of sharing and diversity. So hopefully leadership will get on board with that, but also they need to understand TikTok. If your leadership don't get TikTok, you need to educate them on it because it's huge and it's, it's definitely not going away. Good, cool. Uh, how much did you get paid for that Vogue joke, you know? Did you actually watch well, that video? You can watch the video. Um, <laughs> I get it, you get it. And help it with the traffic. <laughs> yeah, good. Let's uh, go on to the next one. Um, have you seen or do you know of any companies that are using TikTok for educational or, com or uh, communications internally? Hmm. I would say the straight answer is no, but I know of a few companies that are using very short form video to communicate information. Um, I had a conversation on my LinkedIn about how do you share information, PDFs or video, and 30% of people were like video is something we're doing, but it's very early days. So I wouldn't necessarily say you use TikTok within your internal studio platform, but you can take the learnings of TikTok from that. Good. I'll, I'll jump to this uh, number two here, because you're taking like, you're talking about breaking down those barriers of gatekeeping, right? Is some gatekeeping good? Or do you think everyone should have access to everything? And how does Gen Z think about this? Yeah, do I think it's any? a really great question. I think that there are positive aspects to gatekeeping, but it's important to understand why you are doing that. There may be cultural conversations around gatekeeping, that this is something also that is enhancing and embracing your culture. Um, and there is a sort of gatekeeping backlash to some extent of people saying, well, I don't want to give all this information for free. I learned it and it came through kind of understanding a subculture, for example. So I think there's positive elements, but you also just need to question internally, why am I holding back this information? What does it serve me? What does it serve the audience? Can I give someone the tools to learn about this themselves? That's also another way of looking at it. Okay, good. Interesting. I'll, I'll take this one uh, down here. Um, Kevin, should brands embrace TikTok to promote the internal culture away from product promotion? So I guess this is about, uh, you, do you think this is a channel to build brand and to build brand conscience and not only for product promotions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously you will have brand guidelines. That's one thing to be really clear about. Um, but I think it's a really great way to educate people about the values of your brand, the authenticity. I know that's kind of the key word that everyone talks about. Um, TikTok 
is more subtle in a way. You don't want to just sell on TikTok. It's literally the last thing that you want to be doing. Um, it's very different to Instagram with that. So you can educate about your, yes, your company culture, what's good about your brand, what's good about working there, but also you can really promote, you know, if your stylist, for example, is allowed to have an account and they can talk about the product in a more subtle way, what product do they like styling with? Can they make shoots that are just for TikTok? I think there's a lot you can do to really create brand awareness and community around your brand. And I think that's really important to understand it's different to Instagram selling. Um, like I said, the last thing you really want to do is go onto TikTok and start selling things. Um, it's a much more subtle approach. Okay, good. We talked about the, different, the differences between generations in, mm -hmm. in this. The top one here, any tips for reaching and creating dialogue or communicating with an older audience in TikTok, any specific content style? So for reaching that older audience or for that older audience to... Well, first of all, they need to be on TikTok, I guess. Mm -hmm. right? I think, yeah, the first thing to do is, you know, create a TikTok account. I would say at the beginning, you need to be very methodical about what you do and don't want to see, because you'll get a whole lot of junk. There's a lot of trash that's on TikTok. I'm not going to dispute that. And you have to kind of educate the algorithm. But once you start seeing there's a lot of good information, you can take leads from that and think, okay, what is that person saying or doing that's really interesting? How do they open their video? How do they finish their video? Maybe I can do that. And you'll see, actually, there's a, there is a wave of... I would say slightly older creators, like I am on TikTok, so there are older creators on TikTok that are trying to kind of mimic some of the ways that Gen Z are behaving, but obviously I don't want to come across as if I'm a Gen Z person. Um, so it's about, like I said, it's honesty, authenticity, and it's about creating community through giving good dialogue and good information. Perfect, great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.